My name is Susan Derwin. I'm the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Drone Symposium, which is part of Fallout in the Aftermath of War, the year-long IHC series focusing on the impact of the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today's event has been organized for the Center for Informa Information Technology and Society and is co-sponsored by the IHC and the Departments of Art, Feminist Studies, Film and Media Studies, Sociology, and the Global Studies Program. Before we begin, I want to mention an upcoming cluster of events that will be focused on the global reverberations of the recent wars. On Thursday, March 7, Professor Wally Amadi of UC Berkeley will give a talk here entitled Fictions of Friction, Narratives of War and Post-War in Contemporary Afghan Literature. And on Tuesday, April 9, the IHC will hold another symposium on the legacy of Abu Ghraib. Lastly, in early May, the biannual Arthur N. Roop Great Debate will take place on, camp on campus in Campbell Hall, and the topic of this year's debate will be drones. So stay tuned, we're just finalizing our date and the final debaters. A very important logistic. Um, we are going to have a short coffee break at three o'clock. So grab a cup of coffee, but do not tarry. We have to be back <laughs> in our seats to continue. We have a wonderful program, as you know, and we do need every minute of it. So without further delay, please allow me to introduce the director of the Center for Information Technology and Society and the organizer of today's event, Professor Lisa Parks. Thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. I also want to thank the IHC and especially Susan Derwin and Emily Zinn and also the CITS staff members, Melissa Bader and Galen Stocking for their help in organizing our event today. I also want to thank the speakers for traveling here to participate. The US and international use of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles is an urgent topic that demands our collective attention and deliberation across disciplines, cities, and countries. Although drones have a long history, they began to make international press headlines more recently in 2009 when the CIA secret drone war in Pakistan became public through the inadvertent leak of an image in Google Earth of predators at a CIA base in Shamsi, Pakistan. Sorry. Later that year after this image was released, um, there was a detailed uh, investigative report in the New Yorker by Jane Mayer, who's also the author of The Dark Side. Since 2009, there's been a surge of discussion of drone technology and warfare in the US and around the world. Just in the last few weeks, drones have appeared on the cover of Time, um, in op-eds in the New York Times, and in, even in places like National Geographic among many other places. Drone use for targeted killing has become the subject of great controversy and debate among political officials, international legal experts, civil rights groups, and peace activists. And in January 2013, the UN Special Rapporteur launched an investigation into civilian deaths related to targeted killing via drones. Alongside the darker uses of drones, for many years there's been a vibrant community of DIY uh, drone users um, trying to preserve airspace for civilian use of drones, as well as for commercial players who are interested in rolling out a civilian drone industry. There's now a drone caucus, or the Unmanned Aerial Systems Caucus, in the US Congress, which is made up of 60 members who are trying to support the development of this industry in the United States and abroad. And since 2011, their political campaigns have received more than $2.3 million from drone manufacturers such as General Atomic and Northrop Grumman. Uh, this group has become a robust lobby for federal spending on drones, which has increased in recent years from $3 billion in 2007 
to almost $6 billion in 2013. And I'm not sure how this, these expenditures are going to be impacted by the sequestering, which begins tomorrow. Um, so the Life of the Age of Drone Symposium highlights work by a handful of scholars, artists, and activists in the ongoing public discussion of drone usage. We have three one-hour panels lined up this afternoon. We'll do our best to make time for discussion. The event will be followed by a reception in the room next door, so you'll have a chance to talk to speakers at the end of the day. And also tomorrow morning, we have a great event happening on our campus at 10 a.m. in 2615 Ealings Hall. It's a related event to our symposium, and it will be a multimedia performance by media arts and technology graduate students and Professor Marcos Novak. It's called Catch and Release, a transvergent exploration of drone technology and dance. And you can see a preview of this work on the monitor next to the elevator, and there are flyers that will be circulating around as well. So please come to that if you can. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Arthur Croker is Canada Research Chair in Technology, Culture, and Theory at the University of Victoria in Canada. And he is the author of many books. His most recent books are Body Drift, Butler, Hales, Haraway, The Will to Technology, Heidegger, Marx, Nietzsche, and also Born Again Ideology. He's also the co-editor with Marie-Louise Croker, who's also here with us today and who he collaborates with in much of his uh, work. Um, they're the, the co-editors of the acclaimed online scholarly journal, ctheory.net. A longtime admirer of the Croker's work, I first met them uh, last May at a conference at UC San Diego called Drones at Home, and I was so inspired that I had to find a way to bring them to this campus so that the community of Santa Barbara could hear uh, about their new research on drone technologies. So please join me in welcoming Professor Croker, who will present our first lecture entitled, After the Drones. Thank you. Lisa, thank you very much for such a generous introduction. And I'd like to thank the IHC and uh, Lisa Center for Information Technology and Society for this uh, wonderful invitation to present and just say how great it is to be here and, and meet the community of the university. I'd like to present a talk. I'm going to do two things today. I'd like to present a talk called After the Drones, and I'm going to follow that by a new video that we've done with Jackson Two Bears and Mary Louise Croker is right over here, which is called After the Drones as well. So it'll be a talk and a video. And for myself, as I give this talk, what's really in the back of my mind is I'm thinking of the connection between After the Drones and this living in a Kafkaesque, increasingly that strikes me as a Kafkaesque period of living in the environment of the disposition matrix. Uh, disposition matrix, just even by the definition of the term, means the um, reducing bodies to scrap excess and waste on the one hand, but it also really means, in the sense of dispose, it means, in fact, the imposition of a classificatory algorithmic and what Judith Butler would call a regime of new political intelligibility increasingly in the world's population. And I'm really mindful of Good Guardian report, the good reports coming out in The Guardian, or in their analysis, the real target of the disposition matrix is not terrorists outside the walls of the United States. Their argument is that the real target is the American population itself. So Canadian population on the periphery. So with those thoughts in mind, let me just talk about after the drones. And I'd like to speak today specifically about what I would call the moral economy of drones. The moral economy for myself means that point where the really sublime technology of drone technology and their truly menacing potentialities, this absolutely fateful mixture of the awesome power of engineering and their ethical uncertainty of their future consequences, intended or unintended, introduces for myself at least a strange twist into the order of things. It introduces like I almost like reality itself begins to begin to oscillate. It introduces a cinematic twist, and I like to tell a story about when drones came to town in the form of cynical robots. It introduces what I would call ethical twists, or what happens not to bodies that matter, as Judith Butler would describe it, but what happens to bodies that don't matter in the age of drones operating on automatic, but, apps, but without mercy. 
It also introduces end of species twists and a story I like to tell about life after the drones on that lonely day when the only prosthetics are left to thrive in the midst of species extinctions. And it introduces two strange twists of bodily fate as well, such as in this story about the triumph of drone flesh, has definitely the very best flesh of all in the technological future that increasingly suffocates us. But for all that so deeply marks our identities as a species that had the terminal audacity to spawn its own robotic progeny as the fatal mirror into which it wished to disappear. So let me begin with this story, when the drones came to town. We're increasingly living in the age of this technological realization of cinematic culture. For example, what was once visualized so brilliantly in Bar Battlestar Galactica, with its mythic warfare between triumphant Xylon drones packed with the latest, very latest in artificial intelligence and targeting and acquisition weapons data, running on automatic, complex networks of real-time communications operating at light speed, and the band of an always beleaguered yet highly adaptive human survivors, is for myself, in retrospect at least, a visionary experimental staging of contemporary technological reality. Consider, for example, recent reports about the X-45 unmanned, un unmanned automatic, automated vehicle, a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle that's been developed by Boeing Integrated Defense Systems. The aircraft is being designed for combat missions and is known at this point as a concept demonstrator. Functioning as a prototype for a next, generator, next generation UAV that would operate autonomously, the United States Defense Department is using the X-45 to see if it's possible to create UAVs that are capable of safely and reliably operating on their own in combat environments. In other words, prototyping Xylon Raiders. Not to be outdone, the British military has recently announced plans to roll out what it calls the Tyrannus drone, touted as the moment when, and I quote, artificial intelligence takes over the skies. The Tyrannus drone is envisioned as a new unmanned attack aircraft designed to use artificial intelligence, intelligence to fly itself halfway around the world and select enemy targets on its own, highlighting fears that such military automation will one day lead to weapons that decide when to shoot as well. Noel Sharkey, professor of artificial intelligence and robotics at the University of Sheffield, raised recently the prospect of a scenario similar to that portrayed in the Terminator series of movies in which robots are self-aware enough to start killing humans. As Professor Sharkey argues, and I quote, the ethical problem is that no autonomous robots or artificial intelligence systems have the necessary skills to discriminate between combatants and innocents. In a case of technological innovation imitating science fiction literature, this is, of course, the AI realization of a world anticipating the writings of Philip K. Dick, where robots suddenly go berserk, AI systems suddenly reverse, alternate realities intrude, and a sense of radical drift is the new aesthetic. For example, the website Red Ice Creations created, carried a headline recently that said, Machine Rebellion Begins, Killer Robots Destroyed by U.S. Jet. The story continues like this, I quote, An American Reaper flying hunter-killer robot assassin rebelled recently against its human controller above Afghanistan last Sunday and the manned U.S. fighter jet was forced to shoot the rogue machine down before it unilaterally invaded a neighboring country. Red Ice Creations concluded, it wasn't clear from the U.S. military announcement whether the erratic death bot had turned on its masters and was planning an attack on critical U.S. logistic bases located just north of the Af Afghan border, or whether it had sickened of reaping hapless fleshies and was hoping to finally escape. Alternatively, the machine assassin may merely have succumbed to boredom or just possibly a mundane, non anthropomorphic technical fault of some kind. So with these stories in mind, it might be well to consider whether, like the great reference of power and consciousness and sex and truth before it, robots now are entering the stage of heightened cynicism. While robotic futurism has often been framed, at least in literature, 
framed in advance by Asimov's essentially Kantian injunction that our robotic offspring should do no harm to their human inventors, or by Bruce Sterling's beautifully crafted apocalyptic vision in his book Crystal Express of a terminal post-enlightenment struggle between mechanists and shapers, you know, which is really Hegel's reason and passion in robotic form. It just might be the robots probably caught up in the sudden enthusiasm for fictional philosophy and technological inscriptions of cinema and TV shows had themselves been thumbing through the pages of the very latest in post-human literature, paying particular attention to Nietzsche's prophecy that a day will come surely when power will become purely perspectival, obsessed not so much with totality and control, but like everything else with the furies and caprices, with the sudden reversals and capricious, capricious fortune, with the possibility that the introduction into their own cybernetic systems of a, just the barest minimum of undecidability, uncertainty, and unpredictability will finally make life as a drone fascinating and interesting. When drones come to town, not just thinking drones, highly rational drones produced by the high priests of artificial intelligence in their own image, but drones that feel, drones with the affect of the street culture of the sky, those future drones will almost certainly come to town, I believe, under the delirious sign of cynical robots. Bodies that don't matter. There was a really disturbing report in The Guardian recently about the CIA use of Reaper and Predator drones in the northwest provinces of Afghanistan. Since assassinations are illegal, the usual use of war drones in Afghanistan has been shifted rhetorically at least towards targeted enemies, Al-Qaeda suspects, Pashtun resistance leaders, guerrilla fighters. Recently, however, the strategy of targeted strikes has seemingly been eclipsed by a new use of predator drones directed against groups of Afghan civilians gathered together for funeral orations, sometimes fighters, but more typically women and certainly many children, definitely many elderly Afghans. Linking through the violence of funeral orations in small villages in the mountain towns of Afghanistan and sophisticated missile firing drones manufactured in the United States is, I believe, one of those elemental ethics that signals the real beginning of the 21st century, a century which I believe will be marked by a mostly invisible but always violent global struggle between what Judith Butler has described as bodies that matter and what I would describe as bodies that don't matter. In the complex way of most things, this sidereal flow of consequential violence as it circulates among hovering drones in the Afghan sky. Bodies that don't matter on the ground and funeral orations represents really a fundamental rupture in the ethical order of things. Now in his recent book called Tear from the Air, Peter Sloterdijk has written a series of really eloquent reflections on warfare in the 20th century. In his estimation, it's possible to pinpoint the beginning of the 20th century in the sudden use of clouds of chlorine gas against British and Canadian soldiers on the battlefields of Belgium. For Sloterdijk, at this point, warfare ceased to be a violent clash of power against power using mechanical weaponry, becoming something else, something profoundly environmental, literally setting air on fire with gaseous compounds as ways of staving off inevitable defeat. Since that time, of course, the hijacking of the four humors of classical antiquity, air and fire and earth and water, as weapons of global warfare has just been normalized as the violent horizon of modern weaponry. From the blasts of radioactivity at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the deliberate and viciously experimental firebombing of Dresden and Tokyo, the defoliation of Vietnam using Agent Orange to what Heidegger might describe as the framing of the world picture by the shock and awe techniques of the recent Iraqi wars. Well, we have perhaps become mentally and ethically deeply habituated to the violent sequestration of entire environments 
as violent war ecologies, as ways of creating docile populations. It would seem that the actions of drones in Afghanistan should really gain some purchase in our attention, since it represents, I believe, a shift beyond the micro-macro warfare with and against the whole environments of earth, air, earth, fire, and water to a microphysics of violence clearly premised on a moral calculus concerning bodies that matter and bodies that don't matter in these really persistently violent times. Now inhabitants of a technological universe, we are just surrounded daily by chamber of commerce type boosterism through the increasingly sterile, if not cynical claims of cybernetic reason. From business schools with manifestos about big data and the digital humanities with its proclamations in favor of distant reading, to Google's utopia of a life not so much lived as a fatal procession of events, that's Google's timeline. The hegemony of cybernetic reason is everywhere. Should come as no surprise that war drones, this most cybernetic of all spearheads, global spearheads for the distribution and maintenance of imperial power, should be invested with a distinct claim to originality in the ethical domain. Drones today in Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, the Seychelles, and as of this morning it seems, in Algeria now, and who really can be certain about where later, are in the first instance technical manifestations of what I would describe as distant ethics. Here there's not only a clear separation between the cybernetic control of information. I think of those video pilots controlling target acquisition commands on air bases in Arizona and then going to their suburban homes for dinner, but also distant ethics because with almost mythic force, political leadership today has literally distanced itself from the earthly consequences of their action, except in the purely specular role of emotionally invested viewers of the worldwide television that is military command and control today. If the two main ideologies of the day are technological liberalism and redemptive conservatism, perhaps what they share deeply in common when it comes to power is a coeval unitary commitment to distant ethics as a precondition fundamentally ontologically constitutive condition of global power. And I don't mean reluctantly, but I mean enthusiastically. Well, distant ethics is based on a clear separation between action and consequences, whereby only a coded signal intervenes to initiate the execution phase of the drone attack. If those media glimpses of the faces of our political leadership is any measure, there's just very real pleasure to be found in the visuals of sacrificial violence. Here we're finally drawn into the presence of scenes of sacrificial blood flowing from bodies that don't matter, fully entangled with the distant ethics of cybernetic intelligence. And all the while blowback for all this lurks in the background, like an almost invisible but very detectable trace of the hauntological. As the American historian Chalmers Johnson has written, the sorrow of empire is always more deeply mythological than imminently political in nature, specifically that the furies of nemesis, of ancient nemesis, inevitably always follow the hubris of power. Or in the case of predatory and reaper drones, cybernetics not only has an ontology, but, a high, but also a hauntology that will soon, I suspect, be the distinguishing feature of 21st century life. And for that matter, not just living bodies that don't matter, but the targeting of dead bodies that don't matter as well. Politically, this indicates for me that cynical power has now eclipsed the distinction between death and life, restaging both in terms of a greater calculus of imperial violence of a fundamentally new order. Following the writings of Emile Durkheim on the social rituals associated with mourning, we can recognize that the importance of mourning does not simply address grief over the death of a loved one, of an individual, whether of kinship or a friendship, but always has a larger social function. 
namely that rituals associated with the act of mourning serve to reintegrate the grieving spirit of the mourner into the community, into the community of life of the community itself. In targeting the bodies of the innocent, mourners gathered for a funeral in small and isolated communities of Afghanistan. What is accomplished, I believe, is not only terror from the air, but the death of community with its consequent impossibility of reintegrating mourners to ritualistic appeals to the healing powers of life. What is rehearsed through the violent power of predator and reaper drones is in effect the power of death over life itself. For those disavowed and excluded and prohibited, for the, that is bodies that don't matter, what is enforced is really a double ethical refusal. First, a refusal to honor the dead, and then a second refusal to honor the possibility of the power of life through mourning. Refuse both death and life, bodies that don't matter are thus ethically marginalized to the space of the in-between, to be the prohibited, the excluded, disavowed subjects existing in a truly nameless Kafka space, in a nowhere space that is really oscillating somewhere between life and death. It's really little wonder that lawyers for the ACLU have argued that with drone attacks, literally, the entire world now has become a battlefield. While this basic condition of possibility is purely technological, the drone as a cybernetic ensemblage linking aerial hovering motion and visual surveillance technologies and rapid communication, and its moral possibility is premised on distant ethics directed against bodies that don't matter, that are increasingly the majority of the global population, when the world itself is now reconceived as a battleground, its lasting consequences will definitely be ontological. Already nations involved in the new military alliance of imperial power sense the presence of the specter of the ontological. Fear of revenge attacks in direct proportion to the lack of moral accountability for this deadly mixture of distant ethics and bodies that don't matter and the sudden profusion of cybernetic drones are surely the psychological fuel motivating the growth of the contemporary security state with its augmented surveillance technologies and bunkering of the border and severe restrictions on the ability of necessarily nomadic world populations. While the gaze of surveillance can never detect the presence of an angry heart or the bitterness of subjects following capricious and unjustified violence, it's equally the case that fear of revenge and heightened anxiety over attempted retribution by bodies that don't matter enters really a harsh note of repression into the subjectivity of the domestic populations of imperial power. The specter of revenge and the prospect of blowback by bodies is in effect the animating affect that motivates the drift of contemporary politics to the right. Ironically, the more illusionary the possibility of revenge, the more intense the psychological counter-reaction of the domestic population. After the drones. When the final extinction event has taken place, and that lonely morning finally comes when the sun rises on the planet of the dead and the dying, and cities of the vanquished and disappeared, the only visible motion will likely be purely prosthetic. The aimless flapping of wings by vulture robots still circling in the sky on an indefinite hovering cycle. The only nighttime movement, the furtive flights of virtual bats with their beautiful memory-shaped alloys and miniaturized specks are artificial intelligence. And the only sounds those of the remaining virtual hornets or swarms of robotic bees, or perhaps by that time in spectral flights of dragons fashioned in some long forgotten and now abandoned Stanford robotic research lab by a grad student in mechanical engineering who following the literary footsteps of all the great futurists of what was then the human world of Philip K. Dick, Neil Stevenson, and Richard Gall and Raymond Gallon, read Games of Thrones with such feverish intensity that his mind immediately generated its robotic offspring in the form 
of a perfect simulacra of flying dragons indefinitely nuclear powered. The bones of the last humans may have gone to the burial sites, but their residues remain in the form of a lingering mechanics of clones and drones and androids and virtual zombies. And on that day, I wonder, I just wonder, what the real survivors of the extinction event, bats and rats and beetles and cockroaches and eagles and vultures and hornets will have to say. When a turkey vulture looks a virtual vulture in the eye, will it feel technological envy at its prosthetic finery or only a sense of deep shame that it has to share the daytime sky with robotic pretenders on a terminal doomsday flight to a final cybernetic spasm where the, when the virtual vulture crashes to earth for lack of power? And what will real swarms of truly angry hornets make of their simulacra? Will they turn on them in predatory fashion, mocking their sudden defensiveness, or simply swarm on by in hornet-like indifference? What stories would Japanese samurais have to tell about their virtual descendants in the form of the Lockheed Samurai Mav drone? And what memories biblical will crack open the graves, will crack open the earth over the graves of the dead when they hear that the war machine robots called Old Testament names like the Reaper or the Predator circle the earth in one last search for a messiah that never comes? Once the human shield of technology has been removed, I wonder how long a micro bat will last, a virtual worm will squirm, a turkey vulture will hover, an army of simulated ants will continue to dig, or a human clone, clone for that matter, will continue to drone. In the question concerning technology, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger was both, I believe, right and wrong. He was correct in noting that human identity has just been deeply shaped by being swept along in the larger ineluctable technological destiny not of its own making and certainly outside its full understanding. But he was wrong in not noting as well that the destiny of technology is also deeply enmeshed in the mysterious ways of that singularity we call an individual human being. Like human identity before it, Technological identity is also swept along in a human destiny not of its own making and certainly invisible to its full understanding. And just as humans come into their essence with an understanding of technology, so too the future of technology may only come into its full essence with an understanding of human ineluctability. After the drones, after the drones, I believe, is a world of strange symmetries and really strange symbiotics. Drone flesh. In his letter on humanism, Martin Heidegger argued that the epoch of the human began with what he called coming into subjectivity. Vibrant beings invested with a sense of technological mastery of nature, guaranteed by the word of God herself to be the top of the huddle in the hierarchy of species. Beings who, as Nietzsche said, finally caught the interest of the jaded gods of pagan times because they were, in his words, a gamble, a crossing over, content to live with nausea over their own existence, as long as they were a creative drive to the future, a shaper of new worlds, a will to power, a will to will, a will to technology, and nothing besides. But if this is the case, perhaps we can now write the epilogue to Heidegger's letter on humanism in the form of text messages about the post-human the point where something equally epical is now taking place, where the post-human body literally shapeshifts out of the old body of the human with its now discarded subjectivity, taking on the virtual form of drone flesh. Not a human being coming into subjectivity, but now something different. Now a post-human being coming into trans-subjectivity. Like post-human culture, drone flesh is everywhere now, thinking like an algorithm, seeing computationally, packed with technology, volatilized by the, collect by the kinetic en energy of connectivity, bodies slumping into inertia when kept on its waiting cycle. If drones can be fascinating 
and endlessly seductive, both for their engineering feats of the technological sublime and for their truly doubled nature as beautiful specters and ominous skin slayers. That's because their appearance only confirms a subtle, but for that matter, no less dramatic change that's already taken place. Namely, that long before there were drones in the sky and the water and fire and earth, there were imaginary drones at home, drones that long ago nested in the technological skin of a post-human, drone dreams that took to the flesh of the very first of the post-humans, burrowing deeply into the bodies and minds and feelings of an at once and future population of trans subjects that we now have all become. In the way of all mythic stories, technology always comes late to the feast, long before the technicity of N-man perception and augmented intelligence and robotic flight, the post-human imaginary has already unraveled the illusion of the real in advance. This is what makes the post-human culture so tough and really adaptable. It is prepared to be its own condition of possibility, to daily cross the abyss of nausea with its pit of seeing like an algorithm, thinking computationally, to be a being packed with technology, to come alive at the sight and sound of greater connectivity as long and as only as long as it can be a trans subject, a will, a technological creator of its own destiny and nothing besides. Trans subjects, in fact, have always demonstrated an enduring willingness to live with the dangers of technology, but not so much to experience the saving power of technology, but to do something more interesting namely to live in the fractured, liminal, unpredictable space between the danger and the saving power. That is why it is most appealing, that is what is most appealing about dream technology, in my perspective, is its fatal incommensurability. It's truly dangerous, and sometimes it may even be a saving power, but in the end it's finally neither really one nor the other, but both at the same time. And it is so precisely because it introduces a fatal enigmatic tension into existence that we can finally find ourselves truly comfortable and fundamentally disturbed with the prospect of being wrapped in the skin of drone flesh, sometimes on the outside, but now always deepest in our interior imaginations. Not to be denied their presence in the fatal logic of the fourfold whether Heidegger's fourfold of earth and air and sky and water, or Jean Baudrillard's fourfold of the logic of the simulacrum, or Marshall McLuhan's fourfold of the tetrad, the moral economy of drone also possesses its own fourfold of drone logic. In their very first appearance, drones always mask themselves under the comforting sign of being obviously counterfeit imitations, physically imperfect imitations of human sense organs. It was not very long, though, before the aesthetic logic of a drone shrugged off the stigma of being pure imitations of the human to become something else, namely something purely mimetic, something that allowed the seductive power of drones to disguise their intentions within the guise of mimicking nature, drones as flocks of birds and flights of bat and piles of rock, and even drones as mimetic humans in many robotic research labs and certainly in contemporary Japanese theater. But just as drones quickly slip beyond their first order of aesthetic appearance as being purely bad imitations, so too drone logic could never be content with the logic of mimesis. As we know too well from the contemporary appearance of military drones, they've now passed into the order of the hegemonic, that point, that point when drones embody the scent, really visibly embody the scent of visible power Reaper and Predator drones as the spearhead of the global diffusion of technological imperialism. But with this inevitable consequence, like all the signs of power before it, drones always operate under the sign of a fatal aesthetic reversal. That's their truest seduction and their most risable danger. When drones rebelled against the reality principle, by migrating from being intelligent automatons to affective robots, 
At that point, we enter the contemporary age of perverse drones. Drones that are finally free, finally free to display emotion, to display affect, to be haunted. Drones without mercy, but also future drones as memories of bodies that don't matter, as the last ontological trace of a society that prided itself on the creation of its own cybernetic substitutes. The age of perverse drones, this coming epoch of the moral economy of drones that in their technical complexity shatters the reality principle itself. This is of course an age that's long been preemptively fashioned in those early avatars of 21st century culture in science fiction, virtual games, TV serials, and cinematic visionaries. When reality is seduced by fiction, only counterfictions can seduce the real back to its ethical claims. When drones operate according to the logic of perversity, only a greater perversity of human imagination can tease out the fatal liminality present in drones, namely that drones are the first inhabitants, really the original cybernetic pilgrims of the new technological homeland of seduction and disappearance of the 21st century, a century that will be both fascination and fear. When all the technological chips have been played and the last digital hand has been dealt, we can know that with some certainty that we are faced now with this ineluctable choice, not to be either a poet or a data drone, but something else. In the code challenge culture that passes for technological freedom, we've been carefully instructed in the new ways of perception. They're absolutely mandatory. Seeing like an algorithm, feeling like a data flow, thinking like an analytic, with subjectivities packed like a drone, driven by the speed of connectivity, with fire eyes like tracking machines, seduced by an always greater exposure, attention circulating like a flash mob on random, truly, truly in love with the ecstasy of thousands of distant friends, but no close relationships. Everywhere now, there's been a big jump in data numerology and an equally big drop in artistic awareness of our own circumstances. Packed like a drone, what we see outside ourselves may be what the psychoanalyst John Schiller once described as the identified patient, infested really with our own anxieties, burdened with guilt, mythic punishment for what we have become, drone flesh, caught up in the suspense and thrill and terror of seeing our previous home our previous home of embodied perception and situational awareness and historically circumscribed ethics and mediated consciousness quickly vanish in the rear view mirror. Thank you.
when all the technological chips have been played and the last digital hand has been dealt. We can know with some certainty that we're faced with this ineluctable choice. Not to be either a poet or a data drone, but something else. challenge culture that passes for technological freedom. We've been carefully instructed in the new ways of perception. Seeing like an algorithm. Feeling like a data flow. Thinking like an analytic. The subjectivity is packed like a drone. Driven by the speed of connectivity, the fire eyes like tracking machines seduced by an always greater exposure. Attention circulating like a flash mob on random. 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 Circulating like a flash mob on random. Random. Truly in love with the ecstasy, 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 feeling like a data flow. See thousands, 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 ecstasy, 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 of thousands of distant friends, but no close relationships. Drowning in cheap data, no right to forget. Brains rewired. Bodies recoded. Computer logic is our only logic. is how we now see the world. Collated. Aggregated. Profiled and demystified. We're just another algorithm lip syncing the future. 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 So let me introduce our first speaker for session three. Um, Nancy Mancias is a campaign organizer for the organization Code Pink, and she also has worked as coordinator of the, gr the group's Ground the Drones campaign. An anti-war, gay, and women's rights advocate, Mancias has been actively trying to bring the, ho the troops home from their overseas, what she calls their overseas misadventures, and waging peace and equality across the country. She's also been part of the movement against torture and a propon proponent of closing the pr prison in Guantanamo. Like many in the anti-war movement, Mancias views her work against drone warfare as a natural extension of her peace efforts. She's a contributing writer to a book that's a great book she might show us um, called Beautiful Trouble, A Toolbox for Revolution. And this is a book that puts the accumulated wisdom of decades of creative protest into the hands of the next generation of change makers. The title of her talk today is Much Ado About Drones, New Media to New War. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Mancias to UCSB. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here. So. 
How many of you are familiar with Code Pink? Raise your hand. Yeah, there's an wow, that's and that's and of that intel, that's we quite impressive. Well, for those of you, this is going to save someone's life. For those of you who don't know, Code Pink is a women-initiated uh, peace organization. We came out in opposition to the war in Iraq. We are a play on the Bush administration's color-coded alert system. You may remember the days when we were under Code Red, Code green, code orange, well, a group of women got together and said, well, we need a color code for peace and social justice, so uh, they created code pink. Uh, what you're watching here on the screen is a, um, a U.S. Air Force uh, recruitment uh, video of drone pilots and crew flying and managing a Predator drone. This is found on the United Air Force uh, website. The viewer has an option of uh, beginning and engaging in the theater of war. Lisa and I were talking about this earlier this afternoon about the internet. There is a large amount of information out there. There is a wealth of information out there about drones available on the internet as well as available in social media, more so available than through our own government. So, um, for instance, Instagram, uh, we go to a photo sharing app where British artist James Brido created Dronestagram using web and smartphones to tell his side of the story. Dronestagram shows landscapes of a drone strike taking place 7,000 miles away. Each image has a real-time discussion recorded. The project blends art and technology together. Here we can see on February 8th, the last um, image inserted, up to nine killed and six injured in a strike on two separate mud-built houses on the north-south Waziristan border. Local sources reported that six drones were hovering in the sky at the time of the attack and fear prevailed in the area as more drones are flying in the air, halting the rescuers to launch an operation to take out bodies from the debris of the destroyed house. Here is another image on January 8th, 2013. In here, um, there is a quote from retired General Stanley McChrystal. He told Reuters, what scares me about drones is how they are perceived around the world. The resentment created by American use of unmanned strikes is much greater than the average American appreciates. They are hated on a visceral level even by people who've never seen one or seen the effects of one. Although the discussion of drones isn't at the forefront of mainstream media, such as today, what's on the forefront of today's media, we have budget cuts and we have the departure of the Pope. But there is a continuous stream of discussion happening on Twitter. In real time, you can see information on drone and drone protests. Though there isn't a consistent hashtag, it can be hard to find um, things about all of all things about drones um, all the time. Like right right now, someone just tweeted, "Mancius is lucky. Instagram is now available on the internet browser of Dronestagram." So this is a conversation happening right now. So that's a drone stream, and then here's another drone stream. A 
Okay. This last stream, mounting civilian casualties from covert U.S. drone strikes, U.S. government turns a blind eye. And then you can link here to a Washington Post article. So much more information available on social media, new media. If you're interested at all in seeing what a drone looks like, seeing the various types of drones, we saw some here today um, that are on the market or even in creative form. You, of course, can go to Google Images. Everything is online. Or you can go to Pinterest.com and view the different drones that are out there. Here we have a Predator or Reaper drone. We have a Global Hawk. We have something as small as a fly. A parrot. Another parrot. Um, I have to tell you, we are really fortunate to be living in California, such an innovative place from the movie capital of the world, Hollywood, to the tech capital of the world, Silicon Valley. Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, Yahoo, Ustream, and the list goes on and on. Silicon Valley is the home of many tech geniuses. We are le lucky to be living in a time where we can access and challenge open information. And that is what a group of 13 and 15 artists um, and hackers did in San Francisco. They created a flash exhibit on the theme of lethal software. The artists and hackers were given 24 hours to create a project about lethal software. We're now seeing software having a license to kill as advances in computing have made drones and other weapon systems autonomous. So I attended my first hackathon. I was really excited. Um, I'm a total nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff. And I interviewed a guy who was really excited to talk about his drone uh, called Cake or Death. So I'm going to show you that interview. Um, but the next step is that um, a, a bunch of hackers, some of them even here, have been working on ways to control the drone from your computer. Oh, wow. And even to send the video back and have the computer do analysis. That's so, so great. So, you know, like in the next videos, it might be able to detect people and then give them a cupcake. So the, the drone is something you can buy at the mall. Right, okay. Uh, the, the app is something that, that comes with that, so. Oh, okay, so the app comes with the drone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we um, we have a winching mechanism that we've done, and uh, part of this is that it's a, it's a hackathon, so it's basically you get 24 hours to do a project. So that's one of the things that's actually exciting about this platform this, uh, is that it opens it up so that you can uh, people can do pretty cool projects in just a short amount of time. Right. You know, because before it might take you it might take you weeks before you could get something that would be flying properly yeah. to be able to deliver a cupcake. These drone hackathons continue to take place coast to coast in New York and in the San Francisco Bay Area. It would be great to see a hackathon happen here at UC Santa Barbara. 
um, 24 hour hackathon. As I mentioned, California is an innovative place. Uh, we are the number one state um, in drone manufacturing. The drones which are flown over the Afghanistan Pakistan border region, uh, the drones that are flown over Somalia and Yemen, uh, most are built here in California. Manufacturers such as Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Aero Environment, and General Atomics. General Atomics, the makers of the Predator and Reaper drones based in San Diego. Not only are we seeing hackers and artists reacting to this thing called the drones, but we're also seeing protesters, lawyers, human rights advocates, and civil liberty a activists, libertarians, stating position on the legality, ethics, and transparency of drones. The anti-drone anti war activists across the country continue uh, spe to speak out against drone warfare, holding vigils outside of air bases, homes of members of Congress, drone manufacturers, and congressional hearings. Yet, protesting against drones outside the U.S. air bases comes with a high price. Currently, an activist named Brian Terrell, a member of the Iowa Catholic Workers serving six months in, so in a South Dakota federal prison for walking onto an air base in protest. The only way we will learn about these protests is through new media, through social media. These photos here are seeing, um, that you're seeing is a code pink protest taking place in Washington, D.C., outside of John Brennan's house, as well as um, lobbying Congress. As I said earlier, we can access information easily on the internet, but we cannot access information about the U.S. drone program from our own government. The lack of transparency even has Jon Stewart from The Daily Show making jokes. The Republicans want information on the Benghazi attacks, which the White House says is pointless. The Democrats want to know the legal justification for the drone killings, which the president says is totally legitimate. So I think it's pretty clear what the president is going to do next. The New York Times reports the White House is negotiating a way to provide more information on the attack rather than agreeing with demands from Democrats in the Intelligence Committee to release classified information on the legal justifications involved in the targeted killing drone program. What? <laughs> but you just remember the State of the Union with the promise of transparency on the drones. It was dead. State of the Union speech promises are supposed to be slightly more durable than New Year's resolutions. I mean, <laughs> it's been 10 days, my man. Christ, I was on Atkins after January 1st for 12 days. I mean, come <laughs> on. Actually, I guess I shouldn't be surprised there was that telltale cutaway as Obama was talking about transparency during the State of the Union. But that our efforts are even more transparent to the American people and to the world. <laughs> even Obama thought that sentence was bull****. <laughs> but the main question this raises is, what is in those drone memos that is so terrible the White House will give anything, including information previously not seen about the Benghazi attacks, not to have to release them. But more we go to senior intelligence correspondent Asif Manvi in Washington. Asif, uh, thank you for... So I'm going to pause it there just um, out of uh, respect for time um, for our next speaker. So you all can go to the daily 
um, show website and watch the rest of it. It's, it's very good and he addresses the, the need for transparency. So when inf information is eventually revealed or leaked, it's a glimpse into a world of secrecy. We saw earlier this month when NBC News um, Michael Eskoff uh, got his hands on the 16 page uh, white paper which is a confidential Justice Department memo concluding that the U.S. government can order the killing of American citizens if they are believed to be senior operational leaders of Al-Qaeda or an associate force. Even if there is no intelligence indicating they are engaged in an active plot to attack the U.S. Um, I want to introduce you to a book called Drone Warfare Killing by Remote Control by Code Pink co-founder Medea Benjamin. And um, in the book, uh, there are two types of drone strikes. Personality strikes and signature strikes. Personality strikes are where a specific person is being targeted because they have been killed, placed on a kill list for being deemed a threat to the United States. The second type, called signature strikes, are based not on the presence of a known terror suspect sworn to the destruction of America, but on whether the targeted persons or persons pattern of life fits that of a militant in the eyes of a drone operator thousands of miles away. To make matters worse, the government has refused to say how it defines a militant. Despite the murkiness, most drone strikes fall into this second category, second category being signature strikes. I also want to um, talk about uh, pattern of life. When the Department of Justice speaks ex of exact precision, about to track pattern of life from a drone operator sitting thousands of miles away in uh, Nevada or some other part of the United States, you have to wonder whose pattern of life are they tracking. That's just what a group of American anti-drone activists decided to do. They decided to go to Pakistan. Code Pink sponsored a delegation to Pakistan to get the on-the-ground truth of what's really happening there that our government is not telling us. There they met with people who either lost a loved one or knew someone who was hurt in a U.S. drone strike. They met with different organizations and activists partly and partly participated in a massive march against dro uh, drones in Pakistan. Here we just seem so, uh, see some of those photos. I have to tell you some of them are a little, um, a little hard to take. So I'm going to go to this photo. Um, here we have a 16-year-old boy, son of Anwar al-Awlaki in Yemen. Uh, what was his pattern of life? His pattern of life was he was a boy who hadn't seen his father in two years since his father had gone into hiding. He was a boy who knew his father was on the American kill list and who snuck out of his family's house in the early morning hours of September 4th, 2011, to try to find him. He was a boy who was still searching for his father when his father was killed, and who, on the night he himself was killed, was saying goodbye to the second cousin with whom he'd lived with while on his search, and the friends he'd made. He was a boy among boys, then a boy among boys eating dinner by an open fire along the side of a, war, of a road when an American drone came out of the sky and fired the missiles that killed them all. That was his pattern of life. That was his life. He was a drone. How is a drone or a drone operator supposed to know that there is an innocent life on the other end of the HAL fire missile? This is a new war. This is a new war of, en this is a new way of engaging in a new war. Uh, last spring, Code Pink held an international drone conference in Washington, D.C., where people of different fields came together to learn and teach each other about drone warfare 
Uh, we hope to hold another one in the future. Upcoming in April, we are participating in a week of actions in San Diego and a national day of action um, across the country. So in review, I gave you a brief overview of drones on social media, the hacker community, spoke briefly about the protests in the US, activists traveling to Pakistan, drone manufacturers, the leak of the water paper, of the white paper, and government secrecy. Introduced you to the drone warfare book. I have some over here if you're interested, they're only $10. Um, and pattern of life and the death of a 16 year old. Um, as well as sharing upcoming actions. If you're interested in learning more about Code Pink and our campaigns, I also have a sign-up sheet over there um, to my right. Um, and you can learn about our campaigns. And I have one copy of Beautiful Trouble left, so if anyone would like a copy of that. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I look forward to talking to you afterwards at the reception. I'll be the last speaker today, um, and my talk is called Targeted Homelands, Network Visions of the U.S. Drone War in Pakistan. This, we are told, is the cockpit of the future, computer terminals used by U.S. military personnel in Nevada to used to operate Predator drones 7,000 miles away. Drone warfare is often imagined from such positions uh, of computer simulation, networked communication, and remote control. And writers ranging from Paul Virilio to P.W. Singer have commented upon the button-pushing interactivities and joystick robotics that define them. While critical analysis of these practices is crucial, there is often such a fascination with the game-like dimensions of drone warfare that there is a tendency to neglect what happens beneath the belly of the drone. This chapter explores, uh, and this is a short version of a much longer chapter, explores what happens when a drone war orchestrated by remote pilots kills thousands of people in an area where few are there to witness. Few, especially from outside, are there to witness. Since 2004, the CIA has conducted a secret drone war in the Fatah region of Pakistan, a contentious and hard to access rural region on the border of Afghanistan that is inhabited by Pashtun tribes controlled by the Taliban, used by Al-Qaeda operatives, and occupied by the Pakistani military, as well as US uh, military personnel. The Fatah region is extremely difficult for international journalists and relief workers to access, and locals have been punished for carrying cameras there. Despite the fact that the drone war in Pakistan has been conducted as a covert operation in a difficult to access region, information about it, as Nancy has just shared with us, information about this war abounds on the internet, and activists worldwide have protested it. Since 2009, there has been a flourishing of what I call drone media, drone attack scene and protest photographs, television news segments, maps, and data visualizations representing a war that the US still refuses to officially acknowledge. The situation not only raises questions about whether covert operations can be orchestrated in the age of the internet, but also provides an opportunity to evaluate the political potentials of networked media. To develop my analysis, I draw upon the work of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri and Tiziana Terranova, who offer provocative theoretical models for considering the biopolitical functions of images and networks in the context of globalization, the information economy, and the war on terror. Yet, they do not examine specific images or networks in their own work. Networked images not only transmit information, their dynamism, that is, their digital format, storage, and capacity for movement, reuse, and sharing, means that they have the power to affect and infect political consciousness, thought, and feeling in multifarious ways. Terra Nova goes so far as to um, describe networked images as bioweapons, writing, quote, it is no longer a matter of illusion or deception, but of the tactical and strategic deployment of the power of affection of images. It is no longer a matter of truth and appearance, but of images as bioweapons let loose into the information ecology with a mission to infect. In this very condensed version of my chapter, I'll discuss several examples of drone media 
including drone attack scene photos, aerial assault videos, and protest media that have circulated on the internet. I argue that these media, number one, draw attention to a vertical field of biopower, a ground to air, and I would say even out to orbit, domain of life, labor, histories, technologies, and mediation that is increasingly integrated within the flows of network culture. Second, I explore how drone media expose the logics of speculation and uncertainty that underpin drone warfare. And third, I argue that drone media make legible a new class of the disenfranchised, which I refer to as the targeted, people who are the intentional or incidental victims of aerial violence. And before I get into the, some of these um, images, I just wanted to remind people about the casualty counts. The, this data comes from the Bureau of Investigative <laughs> Journalism based in the UK. Um, these are the estimates that exist. Um, so just wanted to, to throw that up there. Um, I'll begin with a discussion of drone attack scene photos, which um, fall, and I've gathered a lot of these over uh, the last two years uh, on the internet, uh, working with the graduate student research assistant, Abby Hinsman. Um, and developed a kind of archive of lots of different representations of drone-related warfare um, that have circulated. Um, so uh, I categorize these images into three categories, photos of rubble, funerals, and then dead and injured bodies. And building on the work of geographer Derek Gregory, I use these drone attack scene photos to explore how the permissible scope of the target has been widened in the context of the war on terror and how the concept of the civilian has been displaced. Um, so the first category then um, features survivors standing amongst and picking through rubble. Uh, this AFP Getty photo from February 2009 features several men standing next to a building in ruins destroyed in a U.S. drone attack. The roof of the building has been blown away and turned into a pile of rubble, and the rebar that once held it in place is curved up toward the sky. Um, I, I look at a lot of these. I'm just going to give you a short summary showing the kinds of images that I'm looking at. And what I suggest is that these photos of rubble emphasize the materialities of drone warfare foregrounding the thick accumulations, the blockages, and the grounded messes that are the vivid counterparts to the drone's orderly cockpits and aerial viewfinders. These um, kinds of photos also serve as a bold reminder that drone warfare is fundamentally about an attempt to control the surface of the earth, to reshape and reform the material world. The second type of drone attack photos that I look at um, portray funeral processions or gatherings to honor the dead, and I'm glad this topic has already come up today. A Reuters photo taken in February 2009 described as a drone funeral <coughs> features six caskets with white flags implanted in them as a crowd of over 100 Pakistani tribesmen stands in the distance to offer funeral prayers for the 27 victims of a missile strike attack in Mirancha. On some occasions, and you know, again, I look at a lot of these different uh, types of images and discuss them at greater length in the chapter. Um, but uh, this photo, this 2006 photo, which also came up today earlier, I think, um, was taken by a predator. And allegedly, it was released in 2006 uh, to the NBC News Network. It allegedly shows a group of almost 200 Taliban insurgents at a cemetery in Afghanistan. U.S. military officers apparently wanted to attack targets within this group, but claimed to have held off because the rules of engagement prohibit attacks on cemeteries. In 2009, however, a U.S. drone attack on a funeral procession in the Makin district of South Waziristan killed at least 60 people and left many others injured. So funerals and, public, and other public gatherings, including weddings, have been singled out for these so-called signature strikes, which uh, Nancy just mentioned to us as well, which targets groups of men believed to be associated with terrorists, but whose identities are not always known. The third category, and again, another image you've seen um, of drone attack photos, communicates the damage do drones do to the flesh, representing dead or injured bodies. And these photos have been shot either at uh, 
an attack scene, a hospital, or a funeral, and are at times used in a sensationalistic manner, often featuring children. There's a large story of this about how difficult it is just to shoot these photographs that I'm completely skipping over here. But one such image, this is from the South Asian News Agency, shows the face of, faces of three dead children as a triptych. And the photo's caption asks, who will avenge the blood of these ca Pakistanis? And indicates that these innocent children, innocent children were murdered by American drones in an attack on Don Darpa Kel that killed 12 people. Other photos in this category feature survivors wearing bandages, casts, or wearing prosthetics, emphasizing the long-term effects that the drone war has upon Pakistanis. And while these photos um, document the fatal effects of the US drone attacks, it's important to remember that not all victims' bodies can be found and represented at these scenes. Some drone attacks are so devastating that human bodies are, are just incinerated and are unrecognizable when survivors arrive on the scene. In such cases, the explosive force of drone attacks further compounds the challenge of counting and accounting for casualties, whether those of militant, whether they're militants or civilians. While drone attack scenes uh, visualize the receiving end of drone warfare, videos leaked or released by the US Defense Department represent attacks from the perspective of remote controlled UAV cameras. Hundreds of them have, been, uh, have appeared on YouTube, DVIDs, Live Leak, featuring attacks on targets in Afghanistan and Iraq, though not very many are out there uh, showing Pakistan. Um, and they show footage from Apaches, C-130s, F-16s, and Predators. Um, many of, I'm just going to play this clip as I speak, hopefully I can, let's see, there's no sound, if I can get my mouse on the, let's see, okay, so, so many of the videos claim to represent insurgents, terrorists, or enemies on the ground participating in alleged suspicious behavior in Iraq and Afghanistan. Voiceover communication on some of the videos reveals that this behavior can include such acts as carrying rod-shaped or heat-bearing <laughs> objects, assembling on a rooftop or a street, standing or digging in a field or near a roadside, riding motorcycles on desert roads, or participating in activities near a mosque. In infrared sequences, targets are represented as moving white or black blotches that signify moving bodies or are identified as the buildings or vehicles in which those bodies seek cover. Once the targets are confirmed, those manning the aircraft drop a hellfire, bomb, or spray machine gunfire on the bodies below, and they disappear into fiery explosions and clouds of smoke. And while there are no leaked videos of drone attacks in Pakistan, I think those, um, you know, that of Afghanistan and Iraq are instructive. Um, here's one that is a, is a very short clip uh, in Afghanistan. Um, this 16 second video uh, shows the viewfinder slightly panning left and right as walking people appearing as black dots are visible. And just as the viewfinder locates and focuses on a target, a missile plunges into an area next to a building and a dog can be seen running away from the blast. These aerial assault videos make intelligible what Judith Butler calls in her book, Frames of War, the differential distribution of precariousness. As Butler suggests, quote, war is precisely an effort to minimize precariousness for some and to maximize it for others. Here, precariousness is registered along an axis of, uh, axis of invisibility and visibility, where US troops are invisible as weaponized vehicles hover above people who appear as moving dots of black or white body heat, signaling the presence of the targeted. The levels of precariousness in these sequences are contingent upon differential access to aerial and terrestrial space, telecommunication, artillery, positions, and vantage points. Apprehending precariousness, according to Butler, requires a shift beyond us and them and victim-perpetrator paradigms, such that these frames of war reveal precariousness for all involved. That is to say, precariousness is part of life for everyone, even for the US soldiers who are shielded by weaponized aircraft or are situated thousands of miles away. It is registered in their heavy breathing, the tension and anxiety in their voices, 
when you hear the soundtracks of these pieces, and even in what we do not see framed, such as the bad dreams, the nightmarish visions, and the unassimilable experiences of veterans' futures. The information contained in these videos also reveals that most aerial assaults are based on an optics of suspicion. Bombings and killings are authorized again and again because people on the ground appear to be, or look like, or are believed to be carrying objects or moving in ways that look suspicious. In other words, the most tentative kind of knowledge is met with the most fatal kind of act. As the frequency of death and death tolls of drone attacks in Pakistan escalated in 2009, they were met with major demonstrations in Islamabad, Karachi, Peshawar, Lahore, in London and Washington, D.C. The Pakistani demonstrations have been organized by Pakistan's National Trade Union, Federation, Labor Party, and Found Foundation for Fundamental Rights, among others, and have been documented by photojournalists, news agencies, and activists alike. Drone protest photos not only reflect uh, Pakistani citizens' widespread discontent with the Zadari administration, they also send a bold message to the Obama administration and U.S. citizens. As you can see, many of the signs and banners are written in English, um, and they're addressed to uh, U.S. citizens in many cases. Um, many of these photos were taken during demonstrations in the spring of 2011, the notorious Arab Spring, when most of the world's attention was focused on mass demonstrations in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, and Libya, while the Arab Spring up uprisings, which attempted to oust the long-standing leaders of corrupt regimes, were celebrated as showcasing democracy in action, anti-drone demonstrations in Pakistan were largely ignored by the U.S. media, despite the fact that Pakistanis, too, are fighting a corrupt regime. The particularities of the political situation in Pakistan, of which I've barely scratched the surface, makes the internet circulation of drone attack and protest photos all the more significant, for they transmit Pakistanis' urgent objections to the drone war across nation-state borders and within the informational milieu. As we have witnessed in other countries in recent years, this capacity has become a crucial tactic in political movements against oppressive regimes, though it can also lead to a situation in which the world knowingly watches on as state-sanctioned violence against civilians persists, as we have seen most recently in Syria. Since the Pakistani government has authorized U.S. drone attacks on the Fatah region using its sovereign power against its own people, and since the U.S. continues to engage in targeted killings, there is clearly a need for spaces and forms of political organization that exceed their authority. Hart and Negri envision the internet both as a metaphor for and infrastructure of this kind of transnational, anti-sovereign political organization. While some have critiqued Hart and Negri's concept of the multitude for its idealism, it remains useful by challenging us to consider where resistance to U.S. drone attacks in Pakistan comes from how it is mobilized and multiplied, and how it can make a difference. Drone protest media can be understood as making parts of the multitude legible, highlighting its various locations, scattered constituencies, and array of positions. The internet has linked Pakistani demonstrators with American activists John Hyde and Gretchen Nielsen, who were arrested after they unfurled a banner declaring, War is not a show, as they quietly stood near the Predator on display at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in March 2010. It connects Pakistani demonstrators with Peace of Action members who marched to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia in January 2010 to protest the U.S. drone program, and with the so-called Creech 14, who were found guilty of trespassing during an April 2009 protest at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. It networks survivors' families in Waziristan with protesters uh, of the General Atomics Predator Manufacturing Plant in San Diego, and with the 200 Americans who swarmed the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. in October 2011 to protest a drone exhibit and were forced out of the museum and covered with pepper spray. And it also links them to Code Pink activists who gathered for the 2012 Drone Summit in Washington, D.C., 
and who recently, this, this past fall, sent a delegation, as we heard from Nancy, to Pakistan um, to meet with tribal uh, people who are intimately and every day affected by the drone war. They also most recently infiltrated the hearings of the CIA, uh, the, for the CIA director, uh, John Brennan, just a few weeks ago. As Hart and Negri insist, the constitution of the multitude is based on the constant legitimate possibility of disobedience. And now I just have a, sh a conclusion. As drone media have helped to catalyze and make legible a multitude opposed to targeted killings, they have also served three other functions. First, drone media have drawn attention to vertical fields of biopower. Since drone warfare is here to stay and is likely to be deployed more frequently and suddenly, it is vital that vertical fields of biopower continue to be critically delineated and analyzed. This analysis needs to extend beyond Virilio's important recognition of the technological fusion of the airplane, the camera, and the gun to include more careful consideration of the biopolitical organization of resources, fuel, labor, lands, hardware, networks, data, sky, orbit, and hierarchies of command that enable targeted killings and the aerial restructuring of life on Earth. Just as it's important to recognize how drone warfare is defined by ro remote control simulation and gaming, it's equally important to acknowledge its grounded dimensions, the landscapes and topographies that register and archive the drone's uses and effects. During the past century, the world has witnessed a devastating flurry of air raids, carpet bombings, and surgical strikes. That the drone is now being heralded by some as a technology of humane warfare is not only deeply troubling, but perverse. Second, as drone use supplements the dark side of the war on terror, that is the profiling, capturing, transporting, detention, and torturing of terror suspects with practices of targeted killing, it has generated a new disenfranchised class of targeted people. Particular inhabitants of Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and the occupied territories, for instance, have become part of a disenfranchised targeted class simply because they live in areas in which terror suspect, suspects may operate. In such areas, anyone and everyone is at risk, and daily life is haunted by the specter of aerial bombardment. Drones may sidestep the dirty work of torture, but they advance other kinds of psyops, using the sky to delineate and administer zones of surveillance and fear, death, and destruction. As drone media visualize the targeted, whether in a drone attack photo or an aerial assault video, they reveal that asymmetric warfare creates new, dis new forms of disenfranchisement for some and greater precariousness for all. Though drones are currently controlled by aero-orbital elites, they are likely to be used by a wider array of political entities in the future, given their relatively low cost and ease to develop. Witness, for instance, the emergence of DIY drone websites or the homemade drone used to monitor police at an Occupy protest in Warsaw, Poland in November 2011, or the fact that most online hobby stores are sold out of most drone models. While the targeted may appear to be isolated to certain law lawless regions or rogue states, the expansion of drone use, including by local law enforcers from New York to Houston on the U.S.-Mexico border and against U.S. citizens, including Anwar Alaki and his 16-year-old son in Yemen, reveals that people across the planet, including citizens of democratic nation states, are becoming part of a targeted class. Finally, as drone media expose uh, vertical fields of biopower and new forms of disenfranchisement, they also reveal that decisions to kill from the air are often based on, upon logics of suspicion, speculation, and uncertainty. Drone pilots make decisions to strike targets based on close readings of distant views and after conversations with parties situated within and beyond the designated mission area. Although targets are typically confirmed by intelligence on the ground, it is often difficult for remote decision makers to differentiate enemies from friendlies, to discern a weapon from a piece of farming equipment, or to distinguish a boy from a man. And there have been numerous civilian casualties and injuries resulting from such confusions. 
A video parody uh, called The Ethical Governor resolves such errors by forecasting a future that removes the human element from drone warfare, delegating all decision making to the drone itself. In these futurist scenarios, drones select and destroy targets using a decision matrix, intervene only according to the rules of engagement, and assess guilt levels after an attack, deactivating weapon systems if the drone has killed too many people. What this parodic commentary suggests is the need to investigate further the perceptual dimensions of drone warfare, to explore and evaluate how remote pilots see and what they know and when they strike. Even though drones are automated systems, the aerial views they acquire and the bombs they drop are received by humans at both ends. Because of this, we can't afford not to respond to and deliberate this new form of warfare, and drone media help us to do just that. Thank you.